Yo. What's good, y'all? What's going on, guys? Y'all already know what it is, man. It's time for another Jordan Peterson. This one is when that's not. Are they debating? No, They're, he's talking to Muslims about Christ. So this is something that I really wanted to see. We got a lot of uh, Muslim people on 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 the um on the Squad team. Squad members. And then, yep. And then you know we're Christian. We have a lot of Christian um, Christ Squad believing members. People. Yeah. Um. So. This is actually really cool, and I'm really curious to see what people say. Again, this is more about the way we're reacting to the conversation that they're having. Just Please don't comment stuff trying to trying to force what you what you believe in. We just reacting to this, and we want to give we want to see what's said. Yeah, I'm interested to hear you know what they're talking about and how they're having the conversation. Is there an ultimate purpose of life? Yeah, sure. What is it? What we're doing here, which is what. Hopefully trying to make peace. Is that enough? We'll see. Yeah. Because if it's better than the alternative. What's the alternative? Hell. Mm. Okay. Okay. Which we're toying with. I don't mean us. Yeah. Well, us too. That's yeah, for no, sure. I, I, but, you know, I, things, are, things are shaky at the moment on many fronts. And we have this opportunity in front of us, all of us, to have a very abundant world, right, where everyone has enough. Mm. And maybe more than enough. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're shaky about that. We're not sure that that's acceptable. And we're not sure everybody should have it. We're not sure everybody deserves it. And even ourselves. Mm. And, and we're retreating into our corners in some real sense. And we're not addressing the elephants under the carpet. And mm. you can't do that. Mm. Like The things we're discussing contentiously now... Mm -hmm. You know, they make for rough conversations, but they make for a lot rougher streets if you don't talk them out. And you have to do that in a spirit of ignorance. Let's go. So what if his belief is not Christian though, right? It is. I now find Jordan out So our first special oh. guest is Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. He is a clinical psychologist and professor emeritus at the University of Toronto. From 1993 to 1998, he served as an assistant and then associate professor of psychology at Harvard. He spent 15 years writing maps of meaning, the architecture of belief. Dr. Peterson has penned the popular global bestsellers Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life and 12 Rules for Life, an Antidote to Chaos. Mm. In 2016, before the publication of 12 Rules, Several of Dr. Peterson's online lectures, videos, and interviews went viral, launching him into unprecedented international prominence as a public intellectual and educator. With his colleagues, uh, Dr. Peterson has, pronounced two on, has produced two online programs to help people understand themselves better and to improve their psychological and practical functioning. He's currently working on an online university dubbed Peterson Academy. Please welcome Dr. Peterson. We also have with us Jonathan Peugeot. He is an artist and he studies Christian symbolism and he also studies postmodernism, right? God forbid for some, right? <laughs> so we also have with us our beloved Mohammed Hijab. He is an author, comparative religionist. We've seen him with uh, Andrew Tate. Him okay. <clears throat> yeah. And philosopher of religion. He's the co founder of our institute, Sapiens Institute, and is a researcher and instructor, instructor for the organization. He has a BA in politics and a master's degree in history, and he also acquired a second master's degree in Islamic studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies. And he completed a third master's degree in applied theology from the University of Oxford, and now he's studying his PhD on the philosophy of religion, specifically on the contingency argument for God's existence. In addition, Hijab has undergone formal training in Islamic studies with a focus on the Quran, prophetic traditions, and legal reasoning. Hijab has completed Islamic seminary courses and has been given formal permission to relay Islamic knowledge on selected Islamic fields. Muhammad Hijab is one of the very few Muslim public figures who deal comparatively with political, philosophical, and theological issues such as and has amassed a following on, uh, with many subscribers on YouTube in English and Arabic. So please welcome Mohammed Hijab and, of course, uh, Jonathan Peugeot. Um, so, 
So, because I'm 100% disagreeable and, <laughs> and not polite at all, um, I want to just, I want to get the elephant out of the room. I do like to, to do that. And um, there's been a recent video that you put up, uh, a message to the Muslims. And before I say this, I do want to speak about the important topics, the theological topics and all these kind of postmodernism and all that. that. That will come, but I just wanted to mention this first. Because I, for me, it's just get the elephant out of the room and then we can move on. Um, Sometimes it's just replaced by a slightly smaller elephant. <laughs> <laughs> well, a smaller elephant is better than nothing. Yeah. Right? Um, what I was going to say is that you know, it didn't land well with a lot of the Muslim community. Yeah. And I, I think the reason why is that it was seen as uh, condescending, it yeah. was seen as um, kind of patronizing. What was your intention with this video exactly? To start a dialogue stupidly and badly. Mm. Because that's how you have to start. Mm. You know, we talked already about the. That's how you get viral. That's the set the, to challenge something and almost come at it like how you say it. That's what makes it. Right, disagreeable. Morality. I mean, he's not. Is that a word? Did I say morality? Is that make? Is that morality? Morality. Virality. Virality. Um, use it in Dan a sentence. Reality of viral. Oh, I don't know. Could be. But anyway, um, <laughs> that's a, what a great idea. I mean, what a great idea. Yeah. You know, that's how you can squash a lot of beef in in things is, is by going head on. Let's not sit here and tiptoe around the subject about how we feel about this. Thing. Yeah. Let's go ahead and dive right in. I feel this way, you feel this way, let's go. The idea of tolerance. And I'm actually not here to be tolerant. Mm. You know, because tolerance sort of presumes that I know what I'm doing and you guys don't, but I'll put up with you anyways. And uh, mm -hmm. see, I don't actually think I know what I'm doing exactly. And so I think, well, you might have something to teach me. And so it's not so much tolerance as I would say, hopefully, something approximating an expression of reasonable humility, which is, well, first of all, we, we occupy the same space. And as far as I'm concerned, it'd be better if we got along. And mm. we've all had our own revelations, you know, personally and, and let's say, socially. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how to integrate those revelations. And that's rough. That's hard. Um, and so I'm here to listen. And... The message was preposterous in some sense, although not much more so than the message I made to Christians, which I wouldn't say, say was exactly flattering. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I thought it would probably ruffle some feathers, but, mm -hmm. but I thought it might also initiate a dialogue yeah. or at least further it. And that has happened, yeah, you know. I mean, Certainly, there were many people who were irritated at me and thought that I was being condescending, and mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to be because I, I do have a lot of people who are paying attention to my lectures around the world on the Islamic side, which is quite surprising to me, especially mm -hmm. with regard to the attention that's been given to the biblical lectures, and mm -hmm. I don't take any of that for granted, mm -hmm. and I wasn't trying to either capitalize on it or, mm -hmm. or uh, interfere with it. I was trying to do the next stupid thing that might move things forward a bit. And that's actually, it's actually worked, I would say. Well, first of all, I am here, yeah. and I know that's not a direct consequence of that message, but yeah. at least it didn't break it. And there have been many other Muslim groups who've reached out to me in a serious way, at least in part because of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to understand that we're going to stumble into each other a fair bit if we actually try to talk, because of all the elephants and the snakes that are lurking under the carpet. And mm -hmm. I think it's a very good thing to get them out in the open. Yeah. I, I'm a very agreeable person, really? as it turns out. Yes, I know, <laughs> it's to my, to my detriment. But um, no, I, I also... I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have guessed, to be honest, that you're very agreeable. Yes, it's, a, it's one of my major character flaws. But um, I don't like conflict at all. Mm -hmm. And But the reason I, I would say I'm prone to engage in it is because sometimes what's under the carpet needs to be revealed because That's it's going right. to cause a lot of trouble if it just sits there and brews or That's brews right. and yeah. multiplies. And so it is one of the advantages of disagreeable people having them around of because course. they will haul things up for inspection that everyone else might um, be loath to confront. Yeah. You know, the downside is, well, you might do that too often, you know, and that's, that's right. a hard thing to get right. Mm -hmm. So I'm not here in a spirit of tolerance. I'm here in a spirit of ignorance and 
I'm hoping. See, the other thing I, I've been thinking through, and yeah. you guys can tell me what you think about this, is it seems that in the situation we're in now, sort of globally speaking, mm. that it would be useful for people of religious faith to note that there are other people of religious faith with whom they have much in common, one of them being religious faith, and that they are also confronting, as people of religious faith, a world that is attempting to, let's say, shake itself <coughs> free of that. And so it isn't exactly obvious to me that it's a great time for people of religious faith to concentrate on their differences, given that there are perhaps more important elephants to address, let's say, or fish to fry. Okay. And so I've been trying to, I'm very ignorant about the Islamic tradition, um, and I'm trying to rectify that. It's very difficult to step outside your own culture and mm -hmm. to really understand someone else's. Yeah. And so, and I'm under no illusions, I hope, about the degree of understanding that I've managed, but I have tried to understand what we might share in common. And that's crucial. And so certainly one of the ideas that we all share in common on the religious front, let's mm -hmm. say, is that there is an ultimate unity that should be placed above all else. And so that's part of the great monotheistic tradition. And I'm going to speak mostly as a psychologist rather than as, say, an advocate of the Christian tradition, because I, it isn't uh, obvious uh, to me that uh, I... Let me kind of push back a little bit on yeah. that point, because you're an individual like, obviously in your newest book, you're, you're talking very um, categorically about precision. And I would say you're an individual that is very precise. You're categorized like, if I was to say anything, I would say that you're an individual that is scrupulously meticulous in exactitude and, I don't know, meticulousness Bet. or whatever, yeah? Factual. So you speak and you think about what you're going to say before you say it. That's what you're known for. And in fact, if someone says something which is uh, kind of off the market a little bit, you pull them up for it, right? And you, you know, usually because I don't understand it then. Yeah, no, no, for example, like the Kathy uh, Newman interview, like the assumptions and the questioning that she had she had when she was questioning you, you pulled her up on it. And that's why it became so uh, popular, the discussion was so popular. And you're a clinical psychologist. So what I was going to say is this, like, for example, if I were to make a video, right, I say this message to the, you know, to white Canadians or something, yeah? Yeah. And I said, you know... It's hard to talk to them. And I say, look, you know, um, sensitively, why don't you reach out to some Russians, you know? Or, you know, heaven forbid, you know, reach out to... The, Black Africans or First Nation people, or, you know, whatever it may be. What do you, how do you think the community of white Canadians, let's say, for the sake of argument, will react to that kind of message? If well, if it was you, yeah. well, you're pretty disagreeable, so you'd probably get bit back a lot. Yeah, but exactly. <laughs> I don't, I don't, it's yeah. hard to say until you do it, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, I have reached out to other communities, let's say. I did an interview with a friend of mine who's a Native American carver mm -hmm. who lives on the West Coast, and, you know, I'm not very happy with the narrative that's being promoted in Canada, which is that the European... Um, settlement of Canada is best viewed as genocidally colonial. Mm. And having said that, my friend, this carver, was in a residential school in Canada, and the residential schools were put forward by the government um, in an attempt, and other institutions, in an attempt to separate the Indigenous children from their families and then socialize them rapidly yeah. according to European norms. And there was some positive motivation for that, and sometimes that helped and worked, but one of the things that did happen was that some schools were, let's say, invaded by people of a pronounced pedophilic and, mm. and sadistic bent, and mm -hmm. my friend ended up in one of those schools, and his life was so dreadful that mm -hmm. you can't even hear about it without, without, without serious emotional damage. And so yeah. you know, I went forward with that discussion, and it was very contentious, but it went very well, and mm -hmm. it... it it told a story that was true and needed to be told. Yep. And so, you know, you step into foreign territory at your peril, that's mm. for sure. But, you know, and it was relatively difficult for me to arrange for this to be a possibility. Yeah, of course. And, and, but my, my thought, again, because I'm trying to look for what we have to offer each other mm -hmm. rather than what divides us, I thought it yeah. was worthwhile. Mm. Well, well, so hey, control that neck. <clears throat> That's the stuff draining down my throat. No, I haven't done that. And ain't no worse than you with all the kicking the table and the cord and the mic.
They can hear that. They can hear that Get goal. Get over it. Let me push back again once, yeah. once again on this point. So, for example, it's not always what you say. Sometimes it can be what you don't say. So, for, for instance, I think you've become somewhat of an emblem of Western civilization, right? In terms of you're an intellectual. Heaven help us. <laughs> no, but you have. And I, I also push back on the point that this is a foreign culture because I think that Islam, and you've mentioned this in the lecture as well, that Islam has now become part of, like, you know, Western culture. Yeah, well, sense. that's the open question. As, yeah, yeah. as we noted in the introductory remarks, it's like, yeah. well, are, is Islam part of the West? We're kind of having the same discussion about mm. Russia in some real yeah, sense. Yeah. And yeah. that's really going well at the moment. Yeah, so, so th there's that part. But what I would say is that, you know, if there, there is a bloody history of Western colonialism, and that's almost undeniable. Like, for example, uh, look at Algeria, for instance. Algeria, when it um, was annexed by France. Uh, uh, there's no dispute there's in There's no that. dispute in what happened there. So the issue, like, I'm giving you one example of many. Uh, the Spanish colonialism of uh, Latin America, for example. Um, Af there, there are things that happened. And it's, I'm yeah. not saying that's not things that happened can, on, on only just on again. the Western front. Yeah. Uh, there are things that happen on the Muslim front as well, of course. This I, is true. Yeah, no doubt about it, right? No, I'm not going to stand here and, you know, defend the Muahidun who came and were very intolerant to uh, Jews and Christians and kicked them out of their homes and so yeah. on like that, who existed in Spain as well, in fact. So uh, the point is, I feel like, I don't know, as a psychologist, I think my question would be to you, don't you think, is it of any benefit to, to be concessionary in this regard? Like to start off a discussion by saying, like, we know um, that these are things that could cause resentment Right? Yes. These, um, because, like, for example, I know a lot of Algerian people, and this is very clear in their historical memory. Yes. And the, the accusation will be that the West have colonial amnesia here. They, don't, they, they are not taking into account what they've done. I'll be honest yeah, with you. Yeah, well, they I've, don't, don't yeah. even know how. Well, okay. So, Do you see what well, I'm saying? Yeah, well, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, look, here, here's how I would address that psychologically. Um, in, in many of the mythological stories that mm. I've read, there is the motif of the evil uncle. Mm. And so, for example, in, in the ancient Egyptian cosmology, mm. um, the, the, there were two, there were four deities, four central deities, although a host of associated deities. And one of them was Osiris, who was mm. the deity of the state. That might be a good way of thinking about it. And he had an evil brother, Seth, who was always conspiring in the background to overthrow the state and to establish his own rules, say, based on power. And the Egyptians, this is thousands of years ago, had figured out by that point, because their society was quite large, that there was something in the social structure itself that posed a threat to the structure, and that was the tendency for the structure and its leaders to become willfully blind and for conspiratorial p p powers or patterns that would use resentment and the desire for power to overthrow mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. they thought of Osiris as willfully blind and mm -hmm. Seth as an eternal danger, and that's true. And, and then, but there's, a, there's another element to the evil uncle too, which is mm -hmm. that in some real sense, and it's a very difficult thing to sort through morally, all of us walk on blood-soaked ground mm -hmm. because hi human history is in some regards a nightmarish catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And some of that's just because life was so difficult, mm -hmm. but it's also because people did in unbelievably cruel and malicious and deceptive uh, Committed, committed unbelievably cruel and atrocious and deceptive acts. And so we're all stuck with this problem that here we are in relative peace and harmony so far, although we seem to be doing everything we can to try to disrupt mm -hmm. that at the moment. And part of the price that's being paid for that is an endless litany of historical catastrophe. And then we all have to face up to, well, what does that mean for us in terms of our individual responsibility? And how do we construe ourselves and our society in light of that fact? Mm -hmm. And we could go back and forth continually about whose historical atrocities were worse. worse right? And that's a rough contest because, you know, the devil is definitely in the details there. And then it also brings up the other problem, which is, well, when the Spaniards went to Central America, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the bloodshed they produced or the death they produced was actually a consequence of the introduction of disease because that took out about 95% of yeah. the native population in the Western yeah. Hemisphere. Yeah. And then the conquistadors were, well, maybe they weren't the finest representatives of the, of the highest flowering of Western civilization. We don't know what, to what degree they were the sort of thugs that couldn't get along at home mm -hmm. and went out adventuring. And, mm -hmm. and then, and, and even if I say, attempted to take full responsibility for that, 
I'm not sure what it would mean because I suspect I have a lot more in common with you people in the modern world than I do with Spanish conquistadors from 300 years ago. Okay. Now, I'm not saying I bear no responsibility for the bloodshed of the past, but I would say we all bear that responsibility, and that's something, I would say that's something like the conception of original sin. Yeah, and that's the point you know? of difference. Uh, to, be, yeah. to be honest, I would disagree with that point. Like, as a Muslim, there is a verse in the Quran that says, well, tells you where zero to zero ukhra, that one soul should not bear the responsibility of someone else's actions. Yeah, well, that that's the other ethical complication. Yeah, yeah. It's so, like, so you know, I, I, can you call yeah. me out yeah. in relationship no, to no, the no, atrocity I, of the of past? Course, of course and, not. No, well, what, what, but, but it's yeah. complicated, right? Because, yeah. but because at the same time you do say, and I don't mean you personally, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know we can say things like, well, the West is not bearing sufficient responsibility for its colonial past, and so at some level that kind of devolves down to the individual. It's so like, let well, me let me kind of rephrase it then. I think you know. I think that's more of a left-wing criticism. It's like, you know, these reparations and affirmative action yeah, programs. Also. Yeah. I'm not advocating any of that. And nor yeah. do I even believe in any yeah. of that, to be honest with you. M nor me. Yeah, so what, what I was putting as an alternative to that is this. is that There is this kind of, I would call this, maybe an Orientalist, a new or Orientalist narrative, which states that Islam is incapable of X, Y, Z. Call it tolerance, call it whatever it is. And look at what's happened in Islamic history. You've, you've got all of these deaths and you've got all of these kinds of things that are happening comparative to what we have in the West. And what we're saying is that let's look at what you have in the West because liberalism was an ideology that was started in the 17th century. Like, I mean, really it was crystallized, you know, with John Locke and all these kind of things then. And after liberalism was established, and in fact, the constitution and fact, the documents of the founding fathers and stuff like that were based on the liberal secular principles. Even after that, you had Napoleonic Wars. Even after that, you had colonialism continuing. You had slavery continuing until 1867, whatever it was, you know, the American Civil War ended. Um, so, so what we're saying is that this picture of history, that, you know, the West is best, basically, this idea, because our ideology can fix all problems, it's not reasonable when you look at the historical records. I mean, one, of, um, one scholar called Navid Sheikh actually done, a, done a, a piece. It's called Body Count. And he was counting the amount of people that died in each... A civilization, and he put the, the Western civilization is the highest. And because you have things like World War One and World War Two, and these things were World War One and World War Two were nationalistic conquests. They, they, they were not religiously inspired. I mean, you can you can argue to what extent were World War One was religiously inspired, but certainly Islam didn't was not a main feature of the 30 million people that died in, in World War One or however many, many million people died in World War Two. So the point is, is that we're saying is that. Uh, and obviously, you've got concepts in the West like manifest destiny, and which I think every single president of the United States of America believed in, westward expansion, these kind of things. The, the point is, is that the proposition that the, the ideology of the West can fix our problems, this is what we have an issue with. Because what we're saying is that if we look mm. at the historical record, there is no evidence of that. In fact, what has shown us is that there's more bloodshed. Individualism has caused more death. Like, you know, with all due respect, I know that you, you, you do cherish individualism. I'm not saying everything is bad about it, but it, when, when, when you have a society deplete of a communitarian ethic, it's bereft of a communitarian ethic, then you can have these issues. And so, so these are conversations, and I think you are moving towards the communitarianism. In your newest book, you were talking about institutions and these kind of things and the respect for tradition and these kind of things. I'm not sure if I'm reading you correctly, but these are the kinds of conversations I think we need to have. But on that point, I think, I, I don't want it, this to be interrogative. And I, I, I just want to interject yeah, please, one please. thing, because I think it's important. I think, Jordan, you're very, you're very kind. And, uh, and I understand, mm -hmm. I also watched the message to Muslims, and I thought there were some problems with it, definitely. Okay. But when you said there's an elephant in the room that I want to address, my mind immediately went to videos as I've seen of you okay. with, with some of your friends in the street. Yeah. and suggesting violence and suggesting uh, aggressive actions against other communities, yeah. which in the West is something that, let's say, in Canada, people don't do that. And that even though there might be civil conflicts, we have a state, we have police, we have an apparatus, yeah. which is there to deal, which is not completely perfect, yeah, yeah. but which, which is functions to install the rules. So when I mm. see someone in the street with, surrounded by men wearing masks, yes who are talking about if these other groups come out, you know, they're going to see us and we're going to be there and I'm okay. looking for Jews and, and we're talking about blood and yeah. there's this very, these very strange behaviors that... Yeah. I think uh, that when if did gonna... I say we're looking for Jews? Do you remember that when I said that exact statement? I just remember you talking to police about... About Jewish people? Yeah. I'd like to get an exact quote. 
<laughs> okay, so I, I don't remember. I recall well, saying Well, the other one, the yeah. one that I definitely yeah. saw yeah. That, that you spoke for quite a while was, mm. was, was relating to some issues with Hindu right, So what happened recently? I don't want to yeah. go... Yeah, well, with this is okay, well, no, I think the reason why it's fine, important... Fine, I guess the reason why it's important is that... Yeah, yeah. Is that I have... See, I, now I like how it's coming in because Jordan was kind of being more agreeable <laughs> and it was like... He was like, no, nah, but what about this? Yeah. Let's, 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 let's get let's, it. Let's hit it hard. Right. Let me call you out on these things and how, you know, you're coming across and what it looks like. If, if this, even though this may not be, you know, you wholeheartedly, but this was a side that you projected. And now let's yeah. talk about it. Yeah. Mm hmm. I'm a Christian, okay. very much a Christian. Yeah. I have many problems with yeah. modern Western yeah. Yeah. culture. Yeah. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And but we are in the West. Okay. Right, and you are in the West. Yeah, and I am a Westerner. Right, and you, you live in yeah, the West, yeah. and so. And I'm British. Yes. Just like you're Canadian. Yes, exactly. Yes. And so the the to Canadian, me the right? elephant in the room yeah. is part. That's part of the elephant in the room. Right, but so, there are many people who yeah, told yeah, yeah. Jordan yeah, yeah. not to come here yeah, yeah. because of those videos. Okay. Well, there's a lot of people that told me not to have this conversation with Jordan sure. because yeah, of yeah. some of his videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why me Lots and Jordan. Lots of people don't yeah. want to have difficult exactly. conversations. Exactly. But what I'm saying with Jordan true. is that. The, what makes him gallant and brave is that despite of those voices that are the voices of disunity, because he's been cancelled more times than I have, yeah? But despite the fact that he's been cancelled in Cambridge University or whatever, I don't care about all these institutions. With, with all due respect, I know this man is a, is a person of influence. And in my estimation, I see him as one of the most, if not the most influential Western public voice. Mm. Right? So for that reason, I speak to him. And for that reason, I, I don't apologize to anyone for doing so. And I think, in, in a way, he sees the same thing in me. Maybe not to the same level, but the fact that I'm half his age, he knows what's going to come in 30 years' time. So he's, he's playing the cards right. And I think, at the end of the day, my voice, my emotions, what I'm saying in the streets of London or Leicester, or whatever else, is how a lot of Muslim people feel. But don't forget, yes, I'm disagreeable. And I'm not, the, my temperament is not the temperament of the average Muslim. So you've got to differentiate between me as an individual me, Muhammad Hijab, as an individual, and Islam. Do you see? If you say, Muhammad Hijab, you are a hypocrite, you are a bad guy, you are violent. So you know what? That's something I have to look into. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's, if that's your advice to me, that's something I have well, to look into. Well, I would into. also say yeah, there's, yeah. there's no moral advantage in being a pushover either. Yes, I right? agree. And so these things are very hard to calibrate correctly. Yeah. And so, well, and if we come at this in a spirit of mutual ignorance mm -hmm. and with some degree of maybe this is where tolerance is more of an issue. It's, you know, we're going to have to tolerate each other's rough edges and imperfections in order to talk, even if we think that there's something useful to be gleaned. And, you know, my sense is that, well, we're called upon to separate the wheat from the chaff, and mm -hmm. that's not so much to damn the chaff as it is to gather the wheat. And it seems to me in, in the biblical stories in, in the Old Testament, there's an immense emphasis, strange emphasis in some real sense, it's one of the things that makes the text so remarkable, on the um, moral stranger and foreigner. Mm. And so when the society is unstable and shaking in a variety of ways, it's often the moral foreigner who comes in with something wise to say. And I think that's definitely true of those biblical narratives. And it so I was wondering when the uh, guy was going to come in and interject, and I'm glad that I'm he glad did. I'm glad he did, because he made it where, like, all right, let's get to the meat. Yeah. Let's not just Keep tiptoeing around, right, yeah, right. I think Jordan and is tiptoeing. I think he's kind of just like, <clears> you know, <throat> let's not start. But he's like, look, but you said this and did this, and I didn't agree with that. Mm -hmm. And like, okay, that's what I'm going to get to. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I, I like the fact that, of I like the approach and that's what I liked about Jordan Peterson is that I liked his, I like his approach and how he is willing to handle and dive in to controversial and difficult cultural topics, historical topics, you know, psychological topics and not afraid to give facts, but also not agree with you and be okay with not agreeing not with agreeing you. Not agreeing with you because most people have a problem with that. Mm-hmm. Have you ever noticed anytime you don't agree with somebody, it's an awkward silence that you ain't on the same thing now? It's kind of and like see, you stun someone. These are the types of conversations that different groups, belief groups need to have. So there can come, you know, you can come to a happy medium or at least get out and have these conversations amidst 
about the controversy or whatever the stuff is. That's how you get to the bottom of things. That if people is just want to rah, 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 and then you're going to rah, 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 nothing is ever getting done because nobody wants to sit down and talk about it and have the conversation. I agree. I also like the Muslim, his perspective on things too, you know? Yeah, it was, yeah. All right, y'all, man, if y'all want to see part two of this, and this is actually a, a longer series um, or a video, so if y'all want to see part two of this, you got to show up for part one. I won't do part two unless you show up for part one. Yeah. All right, y'all.